Hi everybody and welcome to another piano review here at Merriam Pianos. Today we're taking a look at C. Bechstein's Academy 160 Grand. It's just a beauty of a baby grand piano and you're going to love learning about it. We're going to be talking about the sound, the structural components that contribute to that sound. I'm going to give you my impressions of its uh, action and of course play the instrument so that you can hear it at home. If it's the first time to the channel, we would really appreciate if you did hit that subscribe button and the little notification bell. So every time we come out with one of these piano videos, you can participate and join in our ever-growing community of piano lovers. So without further ado, let's get started with the A160 right away. So getting to know a new piano model is really very similar to getting to know a person. There's many layers of the personality. You start to expect certain reactions and certain behaviors under certain conditions. And uh, there are always uniquenesses that take time sometimes to expose themselves. Uh, and while I find that one of the best characteristics of Bechstein as a manufacturer is the consistency you get from one A160 to one, you know, to another A160 uh, or any other model. Uh, the differences between a 160 and a 190 or uh, you know an A192 or B212, those are the very interesting things where it's not just one tonal brush or one uh, you know uh, kind of a linear spectrum of quality as you go from smaller to bigger or from the academy up to uh, the concert. There's very specific characteristics that this instrument has. Um, and I'll start by saying that this is a piano that I sincerely enjoy. Um, I tend to be a piano player who really enjoys an intimate tone. I like instruments that are highly resonant, but also instruments that present a very immediate attack. So because of that, I uh, tend to be a fan of fantastic upright pianos because great uprights do have a lot of cabinet body resonance uh, that you get out of it, a lot of complexity, but that attack is just immediate. Whereas uh, say on a nine foot, even in a room that's fairly dead, you still have this somewhat um, um, spatial effect because your ear is so far away from where the majority of the sound is, is emanating from. You're always getting more of a room acoustic effect than you are uh, this immediate unfiltered uh, you know, uh, connection with the attack of the note. On this piano, on the A160, you have that kind of upright effect, but with the benefit of a grand action. And as I play the 160 more and more and more, I tend to equate it a lot with the concert class uh, C124 model. Uh, it's got a, a fantastic uh, bloom to the note. Um, It's got a really great sustain. Like a, like a truly impressive sustain. Uh, it also has a lovely bell-like treble. And then there are other parts of the piano where it becomes very obvious that you're playing a shorter instrument. Uh, so I, I think it goes without saying that if you're looking at an A160, you're a shopper that either doesn't have the space for a larger grand, um, or perhaps it's budgetary reasons why you're looking at a shorter grand, but you really wanted the quality or the badge of, of Bechstein in your home. Um, but if you're looking at a shorter grand, I'm going to assume that you already are aware of some of the shortcomings that shorter grands inherently have. 
Uh, and this is also one of the differences that you hear between the A160 and uh, the L167, which is their concert class. Uh, just to reiterate, we're looking at their academy level. So this is an all German made piano, but it is one step below uh, what they consider to be their very best. There is some... Um, as you're playing the instrument, you're getting some uneven cabinet resonance through the instrument, which is something that on the concert Becksteins, there's just none of. Uh, and that's one of the things that you get when you pay for literally immaculate uh, cabinetry, is that you get this instrument where there is no uh, extra sort of woofiness no matter where you're playing in the range, and you're getting excellent uh, uh, cabinet response and excellent cabinet resonance virtually from every frequency at every dynamic level. You don't quite get that type of precision when you're in the academy range and in the 160 it's a little bit different than on the 190. In the 160 it's happening sort of right in the octave below middle C just above uh, the break where it flips uh, from your uh, uh, from the steel strings down into the copper. Uh, but it's very, very mild, and depending on the room you're in, you may not actually even notice it. And then as you get into the lower range of the instrument, uh, the, uh, you know, the most uh, prominent uh, deficiency, oh, forgot where I was looking there for a second. Uh, And then when you get into the lower range of the instrument, normally the most prominent deficiency in a super short grand is that you just have no clarity in the bass. Uh, it definitely sounds like you're on a shorter piano when you push the bass string quite a bit. That super thick copper, there's just almost no way to not have that distort a little bit when you're really, really uh, pushing the dynamic response out of that lower octave. Um, but in a normal kind of a, let's call it anywhere from a pianissimo up to a forte range, it's really quite a balanced sound. So I'm getting a lot of immediate attack, as I, as I said, which reminds me of a great upright piano, but you're getting the response of a grand action, and I think you're getting generally more balance than you would get uh, usually out of around a 48-inch upright piano. So for an instrument that costs about the same as what a concert uh, eight would normally cost if we're sort of making a parallel and with sticking within a Bechstein family comparison. Uh, this is going to give you uh, perhaps um, a slightly more bell-like, slightly less complex tone than a Concert 8, but you're getting a grand action. Um, and so for every player, there's going to be different priorities, right? Some people really enjoy uh, just listening to the complexity of a, a super high-end instrument. Other people really uh, enjoy sort of a more immediate attack depending on their style of the playing. Some people really focused on bass tone. So unless you've got, you know, well over 100 grand to spend, there's always going to be things that you're going to have to prioritize as a piano shopper. Uh, and I think this A160 has a lot to offer for um, people that have specific needs and specific priorities. I always love covering the technical aspects of what contributes to sound in an acoustic piano because that's one of the most fascinating things to me. I mean, we play these instruments and it always feels like a very organic, very nebulous uh, combination of factors that contributes to this great tone when we find a piano that we love. Um, but on the other hand, 
they are intricate machines where very specific engineering uh, design choices by a manufacturer is what's contributing to that tone. I mean, there's no accidents, but yet we always feel like there's a bit of magic there. Uh, so I love uh, where those two worlds sort of um, meet together, this very cold, objective, mechanical world, and then this um, highly um, emotional, subjective um, uh, sort of tonal world. Uh, on this instrument, uh, like I've mentioned in many of the other uh, videos that we do on Beckstein, Beckstein has its own uh, hammer department, its hammer factory sort of, uh, which is allowing them to do some very customized work per model. So every piano in the Academy line, every piano in the concert line has its own, p or has its own uh, hammer design which allows them to customize everything from the shaping of the tail, obviously the weighting of the hammer, the shaping of uh, the felt, how they voice the hammer. Uh, so everything is just highly optimized for the scale design and size of the instrument. Uh, the piano uh, uses a uh, sort of a, a capo tension bar in the top. We've got agros uh, throughout uh, the rest, which is a very typical design. I would say generally that the technical specifications of the Academy is uh, very typical of um, German design that you found throughout the 20th century. There aren't some of those more uh, advanced engineering add-ons that you find on the concert class like treble bell uh, or really highly tuned uh, duplex uh, or some of the uh, uh, super precise uh, rim laminating that's you know similar to what Fazioli has done. So this is uh, uh, more or less um, harkens back to uh, uh, you know 1980s, 1990s design, like the very best that you would have found coming out of Germany um, at that time, and they're just building it to an extremely high level of fit and finish. Uh, we're looking at capped solid bridges on the Academy. We're looking at non-tapered soundboards, but you are uh, still dealing with an instrument that has hundreds of labor hours that goes into it, and that's where you get all of that resonance out of the cabinet. There's just there's no way to get a piano speaking like this unless it's been put together with enough precision that you are eliminating tiny little gaps, um, eliminating uh, you know, imprecise applications of the glue where it's just a little too thick and you're stopping a resonance that should be there. Uh, and the other thing that I really uh, like about the Academy line generally, and it's true of the A160, is they pay a huge amount of attention to the quality of spruce that goes on the piano. So this is still alpine spruce that comes from several hundred meters uh, up as a minimum. I think it might be 700 meters uh, or 600 meters or something like that. Uh, but there is certainly a standard that they just don't go below. And when you take a look at the spruce inside an A160, you just see how tight that grain is. This is definitely old growth spruce. And, and again, that's contributing to just how active and how um, resonant the instrument becomes even at a low uh, energy input. There's just a very low impedance. One last thing I'll mention, because I'm also quite familiar with the Grotrian and the Schimmel lines, the treble on this Beckstein 160 reminds me very much of what you get out of the top level Grotrians, but there is a far more controlled um, uh, upper uh, harmonic around that note. What I find with the Grotrians is that there's sort of an uncontrolled, purposely uncontrolled harmonic around the note, sort of gives it this bit of a, an echo, this envelope of color around the note that's not necessarily part of the tone, but it's almost a bit of a reverberant echo around the tone. This is missing uh, that, and in its place is a very highly structured, but not as complex, um, upper harmonic, uh, upper partials on that but the attack is almost dead identical to what you get on the Grotrian. Yeah, this beautiful bloom.
just beautiful. So let's move on to a quick discussion about the action on this piano. Uh, this is what they call the silver action. Uh, the specific differences between the silver action and the gold action are admittedly a little bit nebulous. Uh, the one thing that is very apparent is just the amount of time that they have spent regulating a gold action and the level of refinement uh, that they uh, construct that gold action to. So I think it probably comes down to these are the same actions, but when they're assembled, the gold action is uh, getting refined down to probably something like three or four thousandths of an inch. Uh, this may be uh, getting refined uh, down to a slightly less stringent tolerance. Uh, and then there's uh, likely just less regulating happening at the factory compared to a gold action. But the geometry to me, feels the same. So if you've got a great technician at your disposal or you're working with a store that has uh, good in-house technical uh, staff available, they could take your academy and if it was something that you were, you know, you're a real finesse player, it'd be worth the time and worth the money to take that academy silver action and probably just get it spruced up to what a gold action out of the factory would have given you anyway. You're going to likely wind up with an ex a very similar uh, uh, you know, evenness uh, through the action, uh, hopefully if you're using a good technician, but in terms of the repetition speed, uh, in terms of the control at the lower dynamic range, uh, I think it could all be there at, a, at basically the same level as the gold action. Another thing I'm going to make mention of, because I hear this from a lot of people, because this Academy 160, and I, I hear it a little bit on the 190, but not as much as I do on the 160 from people who uh, you know, uh, are shopping for it, ultimately buy it, uh, and then sometimes I get these comments once they get it into their home and it's, maybe it's a really big room. They're like, wow, it either, uh, I get two comments. One is it's a lot lighter than I thought it was uh, in terms of its touch or it's a lot louder than I thought it was. Well, both of these are actually connected comments because the point is that this instrument is such a resonant instrument. It's producing a lot of tone out of a relatively small soundboard uh, because of the, the scale design is just so efficient. And so this is where this lovely bloom comes from. I mean, It actually, for about a quarter or a half second, actually gets louder for a second, even at a very low. Yeah, not a lot of pianos are going to do that. And so what that does to your brain is it's like, oh, I played that a little bit louder than I thought I did. I'll play it a little bit lighter. And so when we do that, our perception because, oh, that wasn't a chord. Our perception becomes, oh, this is a light action because I'm playing this uh, less than I was expecting to and getting the same amount of sound back. Um, if you actually weight these uh, keys out, they're no lighter than any other grand piano. It's a slightly uh, shorter one, so normally these are weighted a little less. I weighed this out um, prior uh, to uh, the filming today, uh, and we're getting around 54 in the bottom and about 51 in the top, so it's slightly on the, on the light side but not dramatically so. So my advice to people who are going to get this in their home and if it's in a really live room you want to uh, make sure that you give that room some acoustic treatment so you get rid of uh, sort of an excess effect of what we were just discussing. You don't want this piano to feel so active uh, that you're almost afraid to play the keys. So easy stuff, make, you know, make sure that this is on an area rug. That's one easy way to do it. I know I've talked to a number of studio engineers that say, put a couple of ferns in the corner because all of those uh, small little leaves at different angles help to break up the higher frequencies from sort of creating a, a, a reverberant effect uh, in the room. So make sure that when you're getting this home, and of course you want to be able to show this off, you're going to want to put it in a nice big room, um, but if that room has a whole bunch of glass and a whole bunch of hardwood, this piano is going to produce very close to the same volume 
not necessarily the same tonal profile in the lower end, but the same type of volume as most people would expect out of a six foot. So that's the only um, uh, sort of word of, well, more advice, not warning, uh, that I would issue on this instrument. But in summary, we've got a, we've got a piano that produces both a grand class of uh, dynamic range, but with the effect of an extremely intimate attack, which I love. Uh, it's not going to be everybody's thing. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I'm sort of an upright guy, so I'm a sucker for those instruments that make me feel like my ear is, you know, right next to the hammer striking the string. Um, but you've got the benefit of having that attached to a grand action. So for people who uh, sort of are looking for the best of both worlds, this is an incredible instrument that combines that. Um, if you've got uh, the budget, the L167, which is uh, the concert version of this piano and also just slightly a little bit bigger, uh, is going to give you deadly balanced uh, cabinet resonance, a little bit more than what you get on this, and also a more complex tone, a little less bell-like uh, and a lot more like, you know, shimmering sound, you know, on, on the top third. Um, but for a piano that's literally half the price of that, it's just a stunning value. So uh, if, you know, we've got uh, any customers out there who are in that um, sort of uh, 40, 50, 60,000 dollar range, they're looking for a shorter instrument, for sure you're going to want to spend some time in front of this instrument. Put it on your shopping list and make sure you have a chance to evaluate it because I think it's just a special, cool piano. So glad uh, that we had a chance to share it with you today. Uh, one last note, we are recording today's piano uh, with two Rode large diaphragm uh, microphones. We are not affecting the tone in any way, uh, never any uh, reverb, never any Q EQ or anything. So you are hearing as close to what we're hearing um, as possible. So thank you so much for spending a bit of time with this instrument with me uh, and of you know stopping by to check us out on the channel. If it is the first time to the channel, hit that subscribe button. Uh, these videos are a lot of fun and they're even more fun when you can participate with comments, uh, let us know what you thought, and we do our very best to respond to as many of them as possible. So uh, have yourself a great day. Happy piano shopping. My name is Stu Harrison. This has been Miriam Piano's YouTube channel, and we will see you back for more videos shortly. Sun is rising, feel the warmth of my